I think we're going to get started here, if everybody uh, could just take their seats. So good morning. Um, my name is Harold Haming and I'm the chair of the Municipal Pension Plan of <coughs> British Columbia. Welcome to the 14th annual general meeting of the BC Municipal Pension Plan and welcome back to the Anvil Centre in beautiful New Westminster. Today's AGM will focus on financial information, plan performance, the investment climate and our vision for the future. We have a special guest with us today to uh, help explain more. We have a packed agenda this morning so I'm going to get started right away. First some housekeeping items. There are two parking purchase stations on each level and there are attendants available to help you with the machines if need be. Washrooms are available on this floor right beside the elevators. If you have your cell phone with you, please put the sound on vibrate or silent while presenters are on the stage. We would appreciate that. Also, if you're handy with Twitter, please follow our handle at symbol MyBCMPP and join the AGM conversation at the hashtag MPPAGM. Copies of the financial statements are available for those who would like a printed copy and they are available online as part of the 2014 annual report. There are three forms available in your AGM packages. If you want to submit a question to be read aloud, please fill out the question form. That would be this one. And flag a mic runner to bring it to the stage. Any questions we don't get to will be posted on the website. The personal pension question form allows you to privately ask a question relating to your pension and you will be responded to after the AGM. Please ensure your contact information is written clearly on the form. The survey request form is the one that we ask all attendees to fill out. The survey that we conduct after the AGM is enormously important in helping us to plan future events. Please take the time to participate and provide us with your impressions and feedback. And I'll give you another reminder of that when we leave. The Municipal Board of Trustees is responsible for the management of the pension plan, including the setting of the rules for granting pensions and other benefits, setting contribution rates for employers and members, establishing plan rules, and establishing the policies for investing the plan's assets and reporting on the plan financial, actuarial, and operational matters to the partners and members. Ultimately, the Board of Trustees' decisions are based on our duty to act in the best interest of all the plan's beneficiaries. Your trustees here today are wearing name tags so you can identify them fairly easily. I will ask the trustees present to stand so that those in attendance can see who you are. So first we have Lucas Corwin, Angie Sorrell, Philip Twyford, and Hilary Woodward, appointed by the Province of British Columbia. Next, we have Robert Hobson, Gary McIsaac, Richard Taylor, and Vice Chair Frank Leonard, appointed by the Union of BC Municipalities. Next, we have Lynn Coker, Mary Proctor, Tony Collins, and John Johnson, who are appointed by the Health Employers Association of British Columbia. And next, we have Hilary Brown and Ron Amos, who are appointed by the BC Public School Employers Association. Next we would have Kelly Knox and Chris Finding who are appointed by the Hospital Employees Union of BC. Patty Price and Trevor Davies who are appointed by the Canadian Union of Public Employees BC Division. Next we would have Dennis Blatchford and Rebecca Maurer appointed by the Health Sciences Association of BC. Deborah Ducharme and Bella Brown appointed by the BC Nurses Union. Todd Sweet and I are jointly appointed by the BC Professional Firefighters Association and the BC Police Association. Jane Lindstrom and Diana Loken are jointly appointed by the Plan Employer Partners, the Province and the Union of BC Municipalities. Brian Northram and Brian Schramm are appointed by the Council of Joint Organizations and Unions. Denise Bernardo and Gary Yee are appointed by the Municipal Employees Pension Committee. And Stephen Polak and Barb Sinclair are here today. They are retired plan members appointed to the Board of Trustees by the Municipal Employees Pension Committee. We also have some of our service providers here with us today. The Pension Corporation provides administration services on behalf of the Municipal Pension Plan and the other four public sector pension plans in British Columbia. They assist us by providing client services to members and employers and day-to-day -day administration work, not the least of which is delivering on average 110 million pension dollars to over 79,000 MPP retirees every month. Aaron Walker Duncan, by President of Board Services, is here with us today. And the Pension Corporation staff have a booth in the lobby and you can meet them to ask questions. The BC Investment Management Corporation, also known as BCIMC, invests the plan's assets. The Board of Trustees provides the investment direction and BCIMC handles the day-to-day -day activity involved in managing those investments. 
Representing BCIMC today is CEO and CIO Gordon Fife. He is joined by Lynn Hanna, Vice President of Consulting and Client Services. And there will be a chance to meet them and ask questions after the AGM. Judy Payne is the Executive Director of the uh, Municipal Pension Plan and she is here with us today. Joining her is Beverly Bose, our Board Secretary. Eckler Limited performs the actuarial valuations on the plan and our plan actuary, Richard Border, is here with us today. Pacific Blue Cross administers the group extended health and dental benefits available to retired plan members and Gail Claussen is here from Pacific Blue Cross and she also has a booth in the lobby. The Municipal Pension Plan works with other important service providers. Sean Hatch provides legal advice to the Board of Trustees and KPMG LLP is the plan's auditor ensuring that the books are in order. Please feel free to approach any of the trustees, staff or service providers if you have questions or would like some information. So now let's take a look at today's agenda. This morning I'm going to talk about the impact of pension income spending in BC communities. Next, I will pass you on to Frank Leonard, our 2015 Vice Chair, who will talk to you about the financial position of the plan. Our last presentation will be with our special guest today, Gordon Fife. Gordon is the CEO and CIO of BCIMC, the British Columbia Investment Management Corporation, and he will talk about the following. The economic impact of the plan's investments, BCIMC's vision of investing for the future, the current economy and implications for investing, and managing risk including responsible investing. Following Gordon's presentation, there will be an opportunity to open the floor for questions for myself, Frank, and Gordon, and others. We expect to wrap up about 11.30. To ensure that we have enough time to take as many questions as possible today, we will go through the presentations first and ask that you save your questions for the Q&A session. Now I'll explain how the Q&A session will work. We are changing the format a little bit just to make sure that everyone who wants to ask a question gets a chance to ask it and then have it answered properly. We are implementing the rule of one. The rule is you can ask one question per turn. Once everyone who wishes to ask a question has had their chance, people who have additional questions will be invited back to the mics for a second round. Once the second round is complete, we will move to a third round if time permits. There are microphones by the aisles and mic runners if you would prefer to ask your question from where you are seated. Please raise your hand if you would like the microphone brought to you. Please address your question to a specific person and please speak clearly into the mic so everyone up there can hear you. If you don't want to ask a question yourself, please write on a question card in your package and hand it to one of the mic runners. Does that make sense to everybody? Then let's move on. So we know the MPP is doing it right. In 2014, we received further proof through a new research study. This study measured the economic impacts of retirees and their beneficiary spending, their pension dollars they earned back when they were working and contributing to one or more of the five public sector plans. The study incorporated data from all of five BC public sector pension plans, including municipal as, of course, the province's largest public sector pension plan. We know that retirees from these plans spend their pensions in their communities around BC, but what we wanted to learn is what difference do those pension dollars make around the province. Urban Futures, a Vancouver-based nonprofit organization that specializes in demographic and economic issues, did the research and summarized their findings in a report called Assessing the Economic Impacts of Pension Income Spending in British Columbia. You can find the report online in the Straight Talk area of the plan website and there are a few hard copies in the lobby located in the Pension Corporation booth. Pensions have a direct economic impact on the BC economy by supporting local jobs and the gross domestic product or GDP, which is a measurement of how well the economy is doing. Here's a fact. In 2014, pension income spending from the BC public sector pension plans had as strong an economic impact on the provincial gross domestic product as the forestry and logging industries. That's quite staggering. Pension income also supports the province through tax contributions more than $300 million. Public sector retirees spend their pension income where they live, which benefits both their community and the BC economy. And with 97% of BC public sector pension recipients living in British Columbia, you can easily understand how important retiree spending is in our communities around the province. The report provided some fascinating data and we want to help plan members, employers, unions and others understand 
how important pensions and plan retirees are to the province. The best way to do this is through talking to plan members and le learning who they are and how they interact with businesses and their communities. So we made some phone calls and hit the road. We interviewed retired plan members with their favorite local business owners in six different communities around the province, including Parksville, Surrey, North Vancouver, Prince George, Kamloops, and Radium Hot Springs and Cranbrook. Here are four stories I'd like to share with you today. First up, Lynn Valley in North Vancouver. Uh, meet Elsbeth. I'm told um, she may be here today. If, if you are, would you mind? Oh, there she is, up at the top there. Thank you very much for coming today and participating in this research study. You are a great ambassador for the Municipal Pension Plan. Elsbeth knows that the pension income she saved up while she was a teacher librarian now contributes to North Van's economy. She is careful about how she spends her pension dollars. She chooses to buy friends flowers for special occasions from an independent business in her community called Posey Flowers in Lynn Valley, which is owned by Kristen Ames. Kristen was a certified general accountant who left the world of numbers five years ago to pursue her dream and open her own business. Elspeth has been one of her customers since the beginning. Meanwhile, over in Radium Hot Springs, Lynn Burkett runs Rising Sun Massage. Lynn is an orthopedic massage therapist who offers mobile service for those who can't come to her, and about 70% of her clients are retirees. Retired nursing administrator Rose Bard has been a client of Lynn's for eight years. Rose understands how valuable she and other retired members are to their local economies. Lynn and Rose share a commitment to seniors' health care. Lynn treats First Nations elders and handicapped seniors at Mount Nelson House in Invermere, while Rose volunteers her time helping seniors from Cranbrook to Radium navigate the health care system. Rose appreciates that she can make an impact on her community in retirement, both through volunteer work and by spending her pension dollars in the community. In Kamloops, we met Frank and Nancy Wilson. And I know they're in the audience, so I'd like to recognize you. If you could just give us a wave. So we met Frank and Nancy at uh, their favorite local watering hole, the Fox and Hounds Pub. And the next part of the explanation will be self-explanatory. <laughs> Frank is a retired firefighter and has been a Kamloops resident for 51 years. His wife, Nancy, who's with him today, was a tax clerk for the city. And they've been stopping by the Fox and Hounds Pub for 30 years for good food and great value. That's my firefighter guy for me there. <laughs> Owner Al Deacon says he still runs the pub much the way his dad did and places high priority on making sure his business contributes to the Kamloops economy and community by supporting local events and fundraisers. Loyal patrons like Frank and Nancy help his business so that he can give back. Now we meet Gord and Sandy Hartney and business owner Ken Lee. Ken opened his store Superior Produce in Surrey nearly 20 years ago. Gord Hartney is a retired Vancouver firefighter and he and his wife Sandy have been Superior Produce customers for 19 years. Gord tells us that he and his wife spend their pension income in their community at local businesses like Superior Produce. They get great groceries and Ken Lee gets great customers. Ken estimates about 30% of his customers are retired and he sees the direct economic impact of the pension dollars spent in his store. Ken employs three people full-time, some of whom have worked at his store for 15 years. So that gives you a feel for how pension income from the plan makes a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of people in BC. You can read all the member interviews online in the Straight Talk area of the plan website. The address is here on the screen, and you can find the link on the homepage of the website. One last thing before I hand things over to Vice Chair Frank Leonard, who will discuss the financial position of the plan over the last year. I want to talk about what's going to be covered at next year's AGM. There is big work happening in the plan that is currently underway or just about to start. I want to share with you some of what you can expect to see next year. There are two main topics that we're going to be covering. First is very important. It is the results of the next actuarial valuation. Ongoing monitoring of the plan's funds tells us we are in good shape. But the valuation will not start until the data as at December 31st of this year is submitted to our actuary, Eckler. We expect to know the results in the fall of 2016 and we will share them in detail at next year's AGM. Second, there will be an update on the post-retirement group benefits review. 
The Board of Trustees is currently working with our service providers to examine how we can ensure the continued sustainability of extended health and dental benefits for our plan retirees. The last review was in 2011, so it's time we did a review again. We will provide an update of our progress at the next AGM. So on behalf of the board and trustees, I want to thank you for joining us today. As I said, we will take questions in the last session, so please write them down. Now please, could you welcome to the stage our next presenter, Vice Chair Frank Leonard. Well, good morning. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Harold. Um, some of you might now not know, uh, Harold's a long-time uh, serving trustee of the plan, uh, been chair of some committees, vice chair and now chair, but he's finishing up uh, his term with us not only as chair but as a trustee at the end of the year, and we're going to miss him. So how about expressing your appreciation to Harold's <laughs> service? So... Uh, my name is Frank Leonard. I was appointed to the uh, Board of Trustees in 2002 uh, by the Union of BC Municipalities, or people would refer to it as UBCM. I've served as President of the UBCM, Chair of the Municipal Finance Authority, and I've been a Director of uh, BCIMC. Today I'm going to give you an overview of how the pension plan performed in 2014 and also take a look at some of our demographic uh, trends. If you'd like more uh, information on that uh, in depth uh, in the numbers, copies of the financial statements are available from the Pension Corporation table out in the lobby there. And of course our plan website uh, was part of the 2014 annual report. There's one point I want to drive home, Harold has driven home the point as well, uh, is that uh, the Municipal Pension Plan, your plan, is doing it right. The quote you see on the screen here is from Finance Minister Mike Dion. Uh, during his public account speech uh, last July. He spoke of the superior performance of BC's public sector plans and said when he visits investors and credit rating agencies in Toronto, the United States and abroad, he's often asked how BC's public sector pension plans are performing. When he shares the audited financial statements, people can't believe how well BC plans are doing compared to the horror stories happening in the United States and elsewhere. Even this morning on CNN, some of you may have seen the truckers uh, in the United States losing half their pensions uh, because of the uh, unfunded liabilities. The finance minister attributes the success of BC's public sector plans to the joint trusteeship model we have in place. This model ensures that employers, employees, and their representative bodies are sitting at the table together. Contributions are matched, and each plan undergoes an actuarial evaluation every three years to assess the financial health. Valuation results help each pension plan's board of trustees make informed governance decisions moving forward. Municipal pension plan and other BC plans have become the ones to watch in the Canadian pension industry. In a time where many in the media criticize defined benefit plans, BC pension plans have become a source of pride for our provincial government. And as Harold has mentioned moments ago, they support the provincial economy. Your MPP is doing it right for the province, but more than that, the MPP is doing it right for you, the plan members. The Board of Trustees and I want members to know that they can have confidence that their plan is well run, healthy, and focused on a very sustainable future. This plan is here for the retirees now and will be there for the retirees of tomorrow. So let's take a look at how the plan is doing. When the joint trust agreement was signed, the plan's assets were $15.1 billion. In just over 10 years, the plan's assets have more than doubled. To $40 billion. Plan membership has grown by almost 70%. As trustees, we set the direction for our investment manager, BCIMC. They manage the investments and measure their performance against a funding benchmark. So it's not so much about the absolute return, but the relative uh, return to the benchmark. The measure of success is twofold. First, how have our investment performed compared to an objective benchmark? And second, have we met our return assumptions, which allow us to meet the pension promise? So in 2014, our return was 11.3% against a benchmark of 9.8%, with a five-year annualized return of 9.9%. Clearly, an 11.3% return is pretty darn good. And there's a rumor that Gordon Fife's going to get up here, just flip his bat like Jose Batista and sit down. Um, <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Yeah, there you are. Uh, 
Um, at the start of 2014, the plan had approximately $36 billion. And at the end of 2014, it was just over $40 billion. So the fund grew by about $4.3 billion last year. Uh, we gained $1.8 billion from contributions and $4.1 billion from investment returns. We paid out approximately $1.6 billion in pensions, benefits, and expenses. We have a policy of holding a diverse mix of assets. The assets are diverse across categories, such as equities and bonds. As well, assets are held throughout the world. This works to balance the risk and achieve the best returns for the plan. What you see on the screen here is the plan's investment holdings and investment income. The plan's investment strategy is to put funds into non-equity assets, such as infrastructure and real estate to remove some of the volatility that it has and continues to be experienced in equity markets. In 2013, the majority of the investment income, in fact, came from equities. But in 2014, the income was more balanced between equities and other assets. So while the public equity markets remained strong in 2014, a good portion of the income has come from other assets. If you'd like to learn more information about the plan investments, it's available in our annual report. Uh, and in the Statement of Investment Policies and Procedures, which we call SIP, and they're both available on our website. So let's switch gears now and take a look at some of the demographic trends in our plan. The membership is changing, and it's important to understand how this informs the trustees' decision-making. So at this slide, next year when we meet again, trustees expect there will be over 300,000 members participating in the Municipal Pension Plan. There will likely be over 80,000 retirees. So the number of planned retirees is roughly equal to the population of Victoria, to just put that in some kind of perspective. The number of inactive members has remained consistent around 11%. These are members who are no longer employed with a plan employer, but still have contributions in the plan. And there's another interesting fact. 73% of active plan members are female. That's approximately 134,000 people. This ratio of females and males has been consistent since the Joint Trustee Agreement uh, was signed in 2001, despite the significant growth in the membership since then. So here's a question for you. 50% of active members now work in one employment sector. Can you guess which one? Tick, 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 tick. Yeah, health. Everybody's saying health. Okay. Not that much of a trick question. Over 100,000 active members work in BC's health sector. As the provincial population ages, the need for health services has increased. There's another headline for you. Active members are getting older. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they're part of our aging population. Look at these stats. Over 40% of the active members are over 50 years old, and 10% are over 60. With 184,000 active members, this means approximately 18,000 active members are in their 60s, and could retire in the next few years. To accommodate this unprecedented number of retirement applications, the Board of Trustees is working with the Pension Corporation on new tools and technology to help these members make the transition to retirement. An aging membership plus increased retirement lifespans mean that the ratio of active members to retirees is getting smaller. In 2014, it reduced only 2.3 active members to every one retiree. This closing ratio is part of the reason the Board of Trustees made it a priority in 2014 to create a new method for sustainable cost of living adjustments, or COLA. Money for COLA comes from the Inflation Adjustment Account, which is funded through a portion of member and employer contributions and investment returns for the purpose of paying non-guaranteed benefits. If the Board of Trustees determine cost of living adjustments will be made, funds from the Inflation Adjustment Account are transferred to the basic account to be applied to retiree pensions. COLA is not guaranteed. However, once COLA is granted, it becomes part of your basic pension. COLA cannot be higher than the increase in the Canadian Consumer Price Index, and the cost of any COLA granted cannot exceed the amount of money in the inflation adjustment account. And that's what is at issue here, the risk of depleting available funding. The investment climate has changed. The ratio of retired members to active members is nearly two to one. Lifespans are increasing, meaning pensions need to be paid for longer periods of time. Our forecasts have demonstrated over and over again that if changes to the current COLA method are not made, the funds in the inflation adjustment account could become depleted, 
actually within the next 20 years. If that became the case, the only COLA that could be granted would be limited to what's available from the previous year's contribution. Spread across the increasing number of planned retirees, annual COLA payments would be very, very small. There are retirees in the room that will still be here in 20 years. Think of what that would be like to enter the later years of your life with virtually no change during your annual MPP pension. There are active members in this room who are working and will retire in 20 years. Think of what it would be like for them to move into retirement with virtually no change to their annual pensions. Their experience would not be comparable to what retirees have experienced in the past. The Board of Trustees have a duty to govern the plan in a way that is fair to all plan members. It is crucial that retirees of the future have access to cost of living adjustment as retirees do now. That is why the Board of Trustees is moving to a sustainable COLA method of starting uh, January 1st of 2016, next year. COLA for 2016 will depend on the increase in the consumer price index as of September 2015, so last month. The maximum level of COLA that could be made available is capped at 1.95%. The cap will help protect the funds in the inflation adjustment account and it will help make COLA sustainable for the long-term benefit of all plan members, those retired now and those who will retire in the future. The COLA cap will be assessed every three years in conjunction with each valuation of the plan's finances. So the COLA cap may increase or decrease depending on the results of each assessment. We covered sustainable COLA method in detail at last year's AGM, and we have much more to talk about today. Uh, so if you would like more information about the COLA cap, please take a look at the recent issues of the Retiree Newsletter and the 2014 report to members. These are available as PDFs on the plan's website, and we have copies here today at the Pension Corporation table, which was uh, just out in the lobby, right by the muffins. Uh, please visit the table if you'd like to take more uh, information home with you. In summary, the plan's investments are well managed, and we're happy to report an 11.3% return for fiscal uh, 2014. The governance and investment strategy in place are working hard to steer municipal pension plan into the future. The plan is stable and healthy, and all of us on the Board of Trustees aim to ensure MPP remains a source of confidence and pride for members and for our province. The plan is indeed doing it right. While the Board of Trustees sets the investment policies for BCIMC to follow, Gordon Fife and his team at BCIMC manage that plan's investments. Gordon was appointed Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer of BCIMC in the summer of 2014. So he's a rookie on the stage here. Uh, Gordon has more than 30 years in the investment industry and finance industry and brings a strong and extensive investment executive background to BCIMC. He started with J.P. Morgan in New York and London and then moved to a senior executive positions at uh, Case de Depot en Placement du Quebec and TAL Global Asset Management. Prior to joining BCIMC, Gordon served for 11 years as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Public Sector Pension Investment Board, that's the national one for Canada, which manages approximately $112 billion. He's originally from Victoria. Gordon holds a degree in Commerce from the University of British Columbia and an MBA from INSAD, France. So he could give this presentation in French or English. Your choice. We're very pleased to have Gordon join us today and speak to you about the current economy and the implications for plan investments, managing risk and responsible investment, and the vision for the future. So please join me in welcoming Gordon Fife to the podium. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, Harold, and thank you all the trustees uh, for inviting uh, me here today on behalf of all of the uh, people at BCIMC. We're very proud of what we do and uh, we're very honored to be here today. Uh, yes, I am the new guy. Uh, it's about, been about not quite a year and a half since I've been in this position, uh, but I will say I'm very glad to be back in British Columbia. My parents are still there. My brothers are, are still in Victoria as well. Uh, and so it's been a long time that I've been gone. I left after I graduated from UBC uh, in 1981, so you can do the math if you want to figure out how old I am, uh, and I was heading progressively east till I got to Europe, and we lived there for uh, eight years before coming back to Canada in 1992. 
And as Frank said, uh, the last job I had before I took this over last year was running a very similar fund uh, for the federal government, which was the Public Sector Pension Investment Board. Uh, and so um, I have been doing this for, for some time. But uh, there are some uh, interesting differences that I'll talk about, and one in particular with uh, this particular plan. But before I do that, since we're talking about the new guy, I just thought I'd let you know that I saw the old guy, or I rather I spoke to the old guy yesterday, Doug Pierce, who a lot of you uh, will remember. He actually uh, was with the BCIMC and its predecessor in the Ministry of Finance for up to 26 years. So I asked his permission, and I said, you know, I'm going to be here tomorrow, do you mind if I, uh, you know, I mention that you're happily retired? And he said, yeah, tell them that it's a very interesting experience to be on the other side of the pension equation, and he's enjoying it very, very much uh, in Kelowna where he lives, and he ain't coming back. <laughs> but he's still there. I've got his, dial, his number on dial, and I give him a call every once in a while when I run into something uh, more historic. Now, I mentioned I'm going to turn to some facts about BCIMC, and one important one that Frank addressed is the, uh, the joint trusteeship. You're all very familiar with that. I was not that familiar with it when I arrived here last year. Uh, and the more I understand how these plans have been set up and how they work, the more I'm absolutely convinced that all of us are going to start to get visits in the future from other plans from across North America for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, Frank. Other plans are having serious difficulty uh, uh, with, uh, with their, their finances, more so in the U.S. than in Canada. The Canadian plans, as you've probably seen, are, have been historically very well run and are, are very sophisticated. Uh, but what's happening is government balance sheets today are in much worse shape than they were back before the last financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And so today, most plans are starting to get back close to being fully funded. And as, uh, as was mentioned here, uh, our plans uh, are also all back close to fully funded, or some of them may be even slightly in surplus now. But a lot of other plans are not, although they've been improving as markets have been quite strong since 2009. But for sure, there will be another downturn in the markets. That's how markets work. They go up for a long time, and then they violently go down. And when this happens next time, governments are going to be in much worse shape, and it's going to get much more difficult. And they're going to look for solutions. And what British Columbia has found in this joint trusteeship is a very successful uh, way to manage these plans uh, uh, for sustainability. So I'm absolutely convinced, and I've been telling my team, uh, that we, w we should expect a lot of visitors, and I think the plans and the trustees should as well in the future from other plans across North America that are, having, are going to be having serious, uh, serious difficulty. So some of the other facts uh, around uh, BCIMC. Uh, it is at the end of the last fiscal year, which was at the end of March 2015, managing just under $124 billion. That makes our plan the fourth largest in Canada. Now, BCIMC manages assets for 34 clients. 83% of those are pension plans. And the largest eight clients that we have, both pension and non-pension, account for over 95% of all of the money that is managed by BCIMC. And of all of those clients, the municipal pension is by far our largest client. And so... Um, uh, at just over $40 billion uh, at last count, last week. We manage assets for 526,000 pension members. That's both retired and uh, currently active. And the portfolio is one uh, of diversified assets, which I'll touch on more in just a moment. And all of this is done from Victoria. So what does BCIMC do? Well, it was mentioned about the, the, uh, the state of finances uh, of the plan. And what really happens is there's contributions that the uh, currently employed uh, members make, and then there's outflows to those who have retired. And the actuaries tell us that we need to earn a long-term return of about 6.5% nominal to keep all of this in balance, so the inflows and the outflows. And I'll touch on that a bit more in a moment. So the plan, over the long run, we need to earn 6.5%. Now, if we were to uh, invest all of your money into government bonds, so if we were to take all of that and invest in government bonds today, the $40, $42 billion, 
If we were to put it into two-year government bonds, we'd be earning today about a half a percent versus the six and a half percent that we need to earn to keep all of this in balance. So that's a shortfall of about six percent, six percent of, uh, uh, sorry, of, uh, yeah, six percent, six percent of 40 billion dollars is just shy of two and a half billion dollars a year of shortfall. Now let's say we extended, took a little bit more risk and we went and bought 10-year government bonds. They're yielding about, they're paying about one and a half percent. So there would be about a 5% shortfall. So that's about $2 billion. So if we were to invest just in bonds, we would be having an annual shortfall for this particular plan of between two and two and a half billion dollars each and every year. So what that means is that BCIMC has to diversify your portfolio. We have to invest in, uh, in, as in other asset classes besides bonds and we have to invest outside of Canada. And so what you'll find is that uh, we have to take investment risk. We must take investment risk in order to keep the plan in balance and over the long run generate the sorts of return that will average uh, or will be on average 6.5% a year. And so we are investing besides in bonds in mortgages, stocks, real estate, infrastructure, private equity, timberland to give some examples and we're doing this uh, around the world. Uh, and that is the basic function of BCIMC. Now, in addition to the investment responsibility that we have, uh, we, do, uh, we do meet regularly with uh, members of the plan and with your trustees. Uh, and in the last year, we've had uh, at least 20 meetings with various uh, committees and membership, members of the, uh, of the, me of the pension plan uh, to make sure that uh, we're understanding the objectives and that they're understanding uh, what we're doing in the portfolio. Now, why does this matter? As I said, uh, we're trying to keep everything in balance. So today, someone receiving a dollar of pension, 75 cents of every dollar of pension that's paid is the accumulated returns that have been earned on the, the original 25 cents that was put into the plan. So 75, 25 cents of every dollar is the original contribution. 75 cents is the investment return uh, over the life of that uh, 25 cents being invested. Now, as, uh, as Frank suggested, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, and, but very briefly about, the call it the state of the world, the financial markets, and let me just say that the financial markets are never dull. I've been doing this for a very long time. And lately, volatility, if you've been following it through the summer, there's been a lot of, a lot of volatility after a long period of pretty strong returns uh, in the markets. And I'm not sure when, but one thing I am sure is that there will be another downturn in the markets, whether it's a crash or a slow decline. For sure, equity markets and ownership assets will decline in value again. I don't know if it's going to be next week or if it's going to be sometime over the next two or three years, but for sure, it's going to happen. And let me just say that that's okay. Because BCIMC and your pension plan are investing regularly in the markets. So we're continually buying assets for your, for your plan, just as you're going and buying groceries all the time. Now, if there's a sale, you're very happy when you have to go into the grocery store and there's a sale. Now, if there's a sale on assets because they drop 20 or 30 percent, so you may look at this and it may twist your stomach around, but if you were to come and visit BCIMC, the chances are that we're going to be smiling. And the reason we're smiling is because we still have to invest billions of dollars every year and all of a sudden we're able to invest it at somewhat of a discount from where it was before the crash. Now the only reason the crash is bad for an investor is because you have to sell an asset during the crash. So you end up being forced because of distress, you have to sell an asset. Now the beautiful thing about a plan like yours and an, an investor like us is that we never have to sell an asset at a time other than our choosing. And so we're never forced to sell an asset during a financial crisis. Now, if you take a look at the books and the returns for the year, what we have to do because of accounting standards is every year we have to value all of those assets that we own as if we were going to sell them into the midst of the crisis. So you'll get negative numbers, but it only gets crystallized if we're forced to sell. And because of the long-term nature of our assets and the cash flows, we're never forced to sell. And throughout the worst liquidity crisis in 80 or 90 years, 2008, 2009,
BCIMC was not forced to sell any assets. And what a lot of us in Canada were doing was taking advantage of everyone else's distress in the world, because not all investors have the same financial situation as we do. We were taking advantage of their distress. It's a terrible thing to take advantage of someone when they're down, but we think it's for a good cause. And we were helping them out of their assets at big discounted prices. So we have an expression which is bad is good. So when things get bad, when the economies get bad, when the markets turn bad, that's actually very good for us because we're able to go and purchase assets. Not only are we getting them at a good price, but we're often getting assets that would never have come on the market and been sold uh, uh, otherwise unless the owner was, uh, was in some uh, serious distress. So in terms of what are we seeing in the world today, we're certainly in a period of slower growth in the next five years uh, we're going to experience slower global economic growth than we have in the last five years. And what this means for us is it's going to be tougher and we're going to have to work a lot harder to generate returns in the next five years than we did in the last five years. And so just going and buying an index, uh, a stock index, uh, is not going to give us the kind of returns that it might have in the past. But that doesn't mean that uh, we're not going to be able to find returns. So think of the, the world economy as a pie. And that pie is now growing slower than it was in the last five years. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find businesses and partners who are able to build their companies and take a larger slice of the pie. So the pie is not growing very fast. If you want to find returns now, you're going to have to get a bigger slice of the pie. And so let me give you an example in China. There's really, you know, you've read, you may have read some things about the slowdown. I know it's uh, in the... In the uh, in the headlines here, you may have read some things about concerns about slowdowns in China, which has been a real engine for economic growth globally the last, uh, the last couple of decades. And it's true, Chinese, China's economy was growing at 10, 12% in the last couple of years, uh, 8%. Now it's slowed down and we're wondering, is it going to grow 4, 5, 6%? So it's a significant slowdown. Now, albeit it's a much larger pie than it was, it's slowed down quite a bit. But there's really two parts to the Chinese economy. First part is the manufacturing, the industrial, and this is, a, this is a, a portion of the economy where there's been a significant overinvestment the last 10 years, so, and it's a very slow-growing part of the economy. On the other hand, there's the consumer, consumption, there's health care, there's lifestyle, and there's, there's a, um, a whole part of the economy which is growing uh, well above 10%, and so a lot of our investments are going to have to shift away from this uh, more industrial part of the economy to more consumer, consumer and consumption side of the economy. And we're going to be able to find opportunities there. We're going to be able to find entrepreneur partners within China, for example, who are building new businesses that are going to grow much faster than the overall economy. So that's why I'm saying we can't just go and buy the index of China or we're going to get the slower growth rate. But if we target our investments, we're going to be able to find some great businesses, companies, and partners uh, in healthcare and in other areas uh, that are going to do us quite well. I was asked as well to speak a little bit about the strategy uh, at BCIMC, the business plan. And the strategy really, whenever you're, uh, whenever you're competing, you have to understand what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and you have to play to your strengths. It's the same thing at BCIMC, it's the same thing in business. And we have two very important strengths, uh, some of which I've touched on briefly. The first is our size. We're managing today just under $124 billion. Now, that's not the largest in the world, but nonetheless, it is, it is very large. And what that means is we're of a size now where it's a lot cheaper for us. If we can attract the talent, it's a lot cheaper for us to manage and make investment decisions internally rather than handing the money out to external people to manage that for us. It is about three and a half to seven times more expensive to have someone on the outside manage your money versus the, on the inside. And so the first thing that we're going to be doing, and we're all, we've already been doing it, but we're going to accelerate that, is we'll be building the team to make more of those investment decisions inside the organization. The second is that these pension liabilities that we're managing are very, very long term, much longer term than other types of investors. And that allows us as I've said, to never have to sell an asset at a time other than our choosing. Now, if you go and buy a stock, and you can think of any stock that's traded publicly, you can sell that stock in a matter of minutes. If 
you call your broker or even now online, it takes only a few minutes. If you own a building, as I'll show you in a few minutes, we own some buildings uh, right here in down, or downtown Vancouver. If you want to sell a building, you're looking at three, four, five month process to turn that building into cash. And if you want to sell, for example, we've invested in a power line in Chile. If we want to sell that power line, I promise you it's at least a nine month effort to start the process and get buyers to go down to Chile and look at it. It's a very, very long process. And what that means is if you're going to buy illiquid assets, things that take a long time to sell, there's more risk involved in that. And normally in the financial markets, when you take more risk, you get more return. So here we are saying, well, we don't really have that risk. We don't have to worry about selling something. But if we own these assets, we're going to get paid as if we were taking that illiquidity risk. But the reality is we're not really taking it because we'll never have to sell. And so we, what you're seeing is that the plan is investing in a lot more illiquid assets, things like real estate, infrastructure assets, timberland, private equity, because we're getting to collect that risk premium. Again, a risk premium for a risk we're really not taking. And so that's the second part of the strategy, is we're increasing the allocation to these illiquid uh, and private assets. And along with that, uh, we, as I said, we'll be investing more in people and in the systems uh, that are going to allow us to do that. So that's the basic uh, thrust, two thrusts of the, uh, the strategy over the coming years, is you will see us building, uh, building the team internally to make more of those investment decisions ourselves, and we will continue to increase our allocation to private and illiquid assets. Now let me just take a moment and look at some of the assets. I rode this train this morning uh, from the airport into town. We have since 2005 been an owner of the Canada Line with a couple of other partners. We, own a, we have a 35 year concession uh, on that. It's carrying, as I'm told, 38 and a half million people uh, during the construction period, 2,000 jobs were created, and there's apparently 256 full-time jobs associated with the running of that, contributing uh, $64 million to the local uh, economy. We've also been an owner of timberland. Uh, in, uh, we've been investing in uh, island timberland since 2005 and uh, Timber West since uh, 2009. Island Timberlands has just over 600,000 acres uh, of timber, most of it on Vancouver Island, and Timber West has just over 800,000 acres of timber on Vancouver Island. Now what's interesting about timber is when the market for timber gets weak, we just stop cutting. And what happens to the inventory? It grows, it gets more. Now a lot of investors can't do that because they need the cash flow. So when the market goes down and the price of a log goes down, they now have to cut more logs to get the cash flow that they need. That's not the situation for us. So we're able, when the markets for logs get weak, we're able to reduce the uh, size of the cut and the inventory grows until the market uh, is stronger again. So timber is, uh, ends up being a very, very good asset for a fund such as yours. Another asset that we've owned for a very long time is the uh, Willowbrook Shopping Center in Langley. And we've owned that since 1993. It is a 646,000 square foot mall. And uh, actually we're looking at adding another uh, 250,000 square feet right now to the uh, north side of the center, if any of you uh, are familiar with that uh, shopping center. And here's our newest project uh, in Vancouver, is on Thurlow Street. It's a 25 story office tower, uh, 400,000 square feet uh, right in downtown. Now, um, it was mentioned that I wanted to speak about uh, risk and responsible investing in particular. And responsible investing is uh, one consideration in managing long-term investment risk. And this is not for us a feel-good strategy. It's not a moral or an ethical dilemma. Because responsible investing and the process behind it identifies long-term risk factors related to the environment, the so social, and the governance of the assets that we own. And what, we've, what we believe is that managements of companies that neglect to consider these aspects of running their businesses are not going to be good long-term investments for us. Because what happens is that these, mess, these risks tend to manifest themselves slowly, 
uh, in a slow creep that can actually destroy shareholder value over the long run. So our investment process brings responsible investment factors uh, into the analysis, not only when we buy the asset, but as we're ongoing uh, as owners uh, of our assets. And I think it's probably been mentioned here before, but it bears repeating that we are a founding, BCIMC is a founding signatory uh, of the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is a UN-sponsored uh, initiative uh, that promotes responsible investment practices uh, in funds such as ours, uh, across the world, by the way. We're not, uh, it's not just in North America. There are a number of my friends running uh, the other large funds uh, around the world that have also signed on to this. So let me, uh, let me conclude here as my 20 minutes runs out. As I'd mentioned earlier, 75 cents of every dollar of pension uh, payments uh, are, are the result of the investment returns that have been earned on the original contribution. And our mandate is to grow and to protect the value of your pension contributions. And we have been working and continue to work closely and frequently with your trustees uh, in the best interest of the plan. Now, I know that there's probably there's a huge range of topics uh, that relate to your fund and BCIMC, and I haven't been able to cover them all. And I hope that if there's anything that's been missed that you'd like to hear more about, uh, we can do that in the question period, which is uh, just about to start. So I'll stop there just to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. But thank you again very much for inviting me here on behalf of everyone at BCIMC. Thank you, Gordon. So as Gordon indicated, the uh, question period is going to begin. Um, so we, I guess first of all, have we got any, have we got any question cards? Um, no? Okay. Mr. McConville. Okay. Brian McConville former trustee, uh, executive member of the Retirees Association. I have a question for Gordon. Okay. Okay. You, you like diversification, but you just said that you're going to bring in more and more investments in-house. Are you not res restricting the investment strategy by taking more of the investment management in-house, and how does this line up with your investment diversification strategy, and are you not creating more risk by relying on your particular type of investment strategy? Uh, well, first, um, the, uh, this is not a new strategy. So this has been in place. Doug, Doug Pierce uh, had been doing this now for a number of years, bringing more and more investment decisions in-house, and the team has been growing uh, for some time. And uh, when I look, um, and I, I've, I've presented this to many of the, uh, the trustees uh, over the past year, when I look at the investment returns, uh, I'll just take private equity and infrastructure, so infrastructure are things that we invest in, like pipelines, roads, uh, power lines, uh, power generation systems. So I take a look at those two asset classes, and I look at them over four years return and 10-year return. And in those two time periods for those two asset classes, I say, how have the investments done that we have made directly? And how have the investments done uh, where we've handed the money to uh, uh, fund managers on the outside, uh, private equity fund managers and infrastructure fund managers. And what I found is that uh, in all cases, the decisions that were made internally have outperformed the decisions that were made in the funds. In some cases, not by a lot, in some others, by quite a bit. And a lot of that's explained by the fee structure. So uh, some private equity funds, now they, they have a fee structure, but they have a lot of other hidden fees in the job that they do for us. And one analysis th that was done by the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan put the total fees that some of these funds are charging at 7%. And wouldn't you know that in the cases where we're outperforming in some cases, it's around 5 to 7%. So right off the bat, um, 
we're taking the fees away from people who are, I guess, buying another jet, and we're putting that back into the pension plan by not having to pay it. And I happen to think that's a, a really good uh, uh, allocation of those resources. Now, what I didn't say is that we're only, I think maybe I did mention it, we're only going to do this if we can continue to attract the talent that will allow us to do it. It doesn't make any sense for us to hire somebody who's going to lose money just because uh, we're going to save a few pennies uh, in, in fees, but we're going to lose a whole bunch if they're making bad investment decisions. So we're only hiring, uh, we're only bringing uh, asset management inside when we can attract the talent to Victoria uh, and to the team to do that. Now, in addition to having said that, we will always have external partners. We have a lot now. I'm saying we'll have a few less in the future. Uh, but there are going to be people in the world who can do things that we just will never be able to do. There are investment platforms of 1,000, 1,500 people doing certain things uh, that we cannot replicate within our organization. So we will certainly partner with them. There are partners investing in real estate in Brazil, for example. Uh, that we, we, we don't have an office in Brazil, we don't have uh, the network in Brazil, so we'll have a partner in Brazil who will operate with us. So we won't put the money into a fund as, as such and give pure discretion to someone, but we will have a partner in Brazil who's looking for real estate in Brazil, and when they find something interesting, they'll bring it to us and show it to us. If we will do the analysis ourselves, and if we decide to partner with them, we will. Now, they may put in 5% and we may put in 95%. And let's say it's a $100 million building. So we would put in $95 million and they put in $5 million. You say, well, is that really going to keep them aligned with you? Uh, but I can promise you when an individual has $5 million on the line, it's a lot of money for them. And that's what we're looking for, is to create alignment between ourselves and our partners. Part of the issue that we have today with some of the external funds is that they get rich whether they perform or not. So we're paying them a fee, and whether they're performing for us or not, uh, they still collect their fee. And so these are some of the things that we'll be adjusting. But all of it assumes that we can attract the talent uh, into the organization uh, to manage the assets uh, properly. Okay, I have a question card here. Um, this relates to some of the comments that um, Frank made in his presentation, and it's please explain active member, inactive member, and whatever the third group of member is. So yes, we have three classes of members. Uh, active members are members who are currently working and making pension contributions. Inactive members are members who were working and making pension contributions and have left their employer for whatever reason, but the money continues to be held uh, until they reach norm normal retirement age, at which time they can take a pension from our plan. And then we have retired members, and those are members who no longer work and collect their pensions. So those are the three classes of, uh, of members. Have we got any other? Ed. Why did you hit the mic? <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's hit it again. <laughs> yeah. Ed Pecos, uh, former trustee and on the MPRA executive also. Um, listening to Gordon Fife, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very well presented. The thing you said about uh, not having to sell and the assets are sort of going to be there forever um, leads me to the question about why we were here last year when we were dealing with the capping of the COLA clause. And uh, I know that the board is looking at that and the valuation is going to be done at the end of this year. Um, and a new cap perhaps will be brought next year to the board or released. What would it take in order to have that cap either increase above the 1.95%? And could the board of directors do it in between valuation periods of three years if inflation ran a little bit higher, but there was funds in the COLA clause or the IAA account? Um, can the board do that? Right on time. So that's, <laughs> I'm going to answer part of that, Ed, and I'm going to let Richard answer the other part of it. You, as you know, being a former trustee, the board has full discretion to... Um, issue COLA. In terms of the framework that's been established, there, there isn't really, to my knowledge, unless Richard says there is, um, a mechanism currently um, to do what you just indicated. So I'll let him answer that part of the question. But you know that the board has full discretion to issue COLA. So, yeah. so it, it is not possible to evaluate it on an annual basis. And I 
the, the, the whole way that it's structured is it's not intended to be done on an annual basis as well. We're taking a long-term view on it. So, so short-term fluctuation, the intention is that you don't shift around as inflation changes. Um, you, you asked what would it take for the, for the cap to increase. It, it'll increase if you have, um, primarily if you have investment performance which exceeds the long-term assumption that we have. So we, when we're looking at the cap, we need 6.75%. Um, so if we have 6.75% or more, then you would see that potentially the cap would go up. It also depends critically on what inflation is. It doesn't help if you have a 10% return and you have 5% inflation, you, you, you're still going to be behind where you, where you would be. So, so it's a combination of the two, and effectively, so if you have low inflation and good investment returns, you'd expect that cap to go up, and if you have low investment returns and high inflation, you would see downward pressure. Okay, we got anybody else at a mic? Hi, Megan Valley. I'm currently an active member, and I just have a question regarding um, changing workplace demographics and the number of inactive members that we have with people moving in and out of workplaces that are with municipal pension. What does that look like? Does that impact the plan at all, or does that does it make any changes to the financial? planning in the future because we don't have if we don't have as many current members that are full-time contributing okay so Richard's going to answer that one as well I can tell you that inactive members are taken into consideration in each valuation but he'll explain how yeah so so when we do the valuation we um, we look at the active members and we anticipate that a certain number of them will become inactive at, at some point so we make an allowance for that and as you go from being an active member to being an inactive, obviously you stop making contributions, but you also stop earning pension. So, so the value of your pension changes. We take that into account, and then every three years, we, um, when we do the valuation, we'll see the effect of it. Okay. So that just means, have we got muffins and coffee left? Whoa. <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> okay, um, so I guess that concludes our question and answer period. Um, thank you all very much for attending our uh, 2015 AGM. Um, don't forget to fill out your, uh, your survey so that we can plan for our next AGM. And as uh, we indicated, there's more uh, coffee and... Um, muffins in the lobby, and that also gives you an opportunity to go to some of the booths that will be manned there. So uh, thanks again for coming, and uh, we'll see you next year.